Esther and I, we loved Mary Poppins, and we had the whole movie memorized, um, and we would reenact different scenes, um, like the spoonful of medicine scene, the banister scene, sorry, mom, and uh, the, the carpet bag scene, you know, where she comes in, basically hires herself, comes in, and she starts pulling stuff out of her carpet bag, and whatever she needs, out, out it comes. And she has a gilded mirror, and a coat hand, and a coat stand, and some really cute pair of heels, and... Um, and then she pulls out this tape measure that says she's practically perfect in every way. Well, today I'm going to convince you that you all have Mary Poppins running through your veins. Um, I don't know your individual circumstances, um, but Heavenly Father does. And if you listen with your heart, the Spirit will tell you what you need to hear. And the answers that you're seeking will come to you. Um, hopefully I will answer three questions for you. Um, by the end of this, why do I want my kids to learn the gospel? Um, two, how can I do this? And three, some, what are some teaching ideas? Um, so let's start with the, the first one. Why do we want our kids to learn the gospel? Well, I can think of a million different reasons, as I'm sure you can. Um, but if we really hone in on the core reasons, I can come up with three. Um, first one is to improve their relationship with Heavenly Father, which includes knowing their children of God, and also knowing and feeling their unconditional love. Um, if children really know this, they will think and act and speak differently. Um, it'll affect their appearance, their treatment of others, um, and their actions. A few years ago, I went to one of my son's um, award ceremonies, and I thought it would be pretty boring, but something happened that fascinated me. I um, was sitting there about halfway through, the administration called um, a kid's name and, um, for an average award. And all of a sudden, the entire student body stood up and cheered and yelled, and they were fist pumping in the air and wow, and just, just going crazy. And I was like, wow, this kid must be really popular. Well, it happened again. Second time, this kid went up for another award, and again, an average award, dare I say average, um, and same thing happened. And the student body cheered again a third time. And I'm like, what is going on with this kid? So afterwards, I asked my son, who was that kid that everyone kept cheering for? And he's like, oh, that was so-and-so. And I'm like, well, why'd people cheer for him? And he said, uh, I don't know, I, I guess they just liked him. I, I was stunned. And I thought, here is a, an average, by all appearances, an average boy getting an average award, but the mere mention of his name caused an uproar that implied fame and popularity. I never did find out what was so special about that kid, but it got me thinking, shouldn't we all be like that? What if we had, what if we all had a, a personal roving audience that just cheered for us when we did things that merited an award? Um, but then it occurred to me that we do. We have a heavenly father and a mother who give us standing ovations all the time. What, imagine how different your life would be if you could see and hear those cheers. You would probably walk with a little more confidence. You might be inclined to cheer others on because you would know how it felt you wouldn't care about being the best because anything you did would be cheered for. And you would be less concerned about your appearance and more concerned about your actions because that's the part that gets cheered for. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our kids had that same knowledge? If they had a surety that Heavenly Father loved them unconditionally, it would, it would change their lives. Well, when they learn the gospel, they learn that. Reason number two, to increase their testimony of Jesus Christ. This is probably the most critical piece of knowledge that we can get as mortals, um, especially because we can't return to Heavenly Father without Jesus Christ. But from a parent's perspective, it's, it becomes a lot more poignant. I look at my little children, and I know a little bit about the struggles that this life holds, and my heart hurts a little when I think of them going through those struggles. Um, and as a result, I want to give them every possible tool that they can have. Um, but really, all they need is one, the Savior. By relying on the Savior, they can make it through whatever life throws at them, big or small. Everything in the gospel points to Jesus Christ. You can't help but learn about him when you study the gospel, and our children will learn that. Um, a few weeks ago, my husband and I went on an Alaskan cruise, and one of the excursion options was a glacier hike, and uh, it sounded kind of cool, and my husband talked me into signing up with him, and then I uh, learned about the details, and I kind of freaked out a little bit. <laughs> Um, this com com kind of adventure was completely out of my comfort zone. Um, they took you on a helicopter tour over Mendenhall Glacier, and then they landed on said glacier, 
and then they outfitted you with full-on stupidity gear. And I call it that because I was seriously questioning my sanity as I was putting on crampons, a harness, a helmet, and an ice axe. <laughs> I half expected National Geographic to pop up and start filming me for one of those, those documentaries like Terror on the Glacier or Mom Meets Mountain. Uh, fortunately, nothing film-worthy happened. Um, but we had two guides who had done this a million times, and there's no way I would have gotten back in one piece without the help, without the help of those guides. Um, before we started off, they showed us how to walk with crampons on. Like They showed us up and down and sideways. Um, then they took, a, took us to an ice cave and showed us how to maneuver in the tight spaces. Um, and then when we had to cross a stream of melted ice, they, one guide straddled the stream and held out his hand in case we needed it. And the other guide was on the opposite side helping people up the bank as they crossed. Um, another time they wanted to show us a crevasse safely, so they stood at the edge to make sure no one got too close or fell over. Um, at every step of the way during the hike, those guides were there for us to instruct us, demonstrate a technique, and lend a helping hand or praise us for following directions. We made it back to the helicopter and they delivered us into the hands of the pilot while they took the next group of people on the hike. And it turned out to be an amazing adventure. Though it's hard to compare Christ to anyone, this analogy helps illustrate the fact that we cannot get through life without help. Fortunately, we have a loving savior who is with us every step of the way. He's holding out his hand just in case we need it or praising us for following directions or standing at the edge, making sure we don't fall off, or showing us the way by his example, or even helping us up the other side of a trial. Our kids need to have a testimony of Jesus Christ so that when they get stuck in sin, they know who to call. When they cry out in desperation, they know who will answer them. Or when they just need someone who understands, they know who does. You cannot make it through this life without Jesus Christ, and our kids need to know that. Third reason. Um, so they can identify and follow the promptings of the Holy Ghost. I've spent a lot of time feeling overwhelmed with the amount of stuff I'm supposed to teach my kids. As my kids have gotten older and moved out, I've, I've wondered if I've taught them all the critical st skills they need, like do they know the difference between a zucchini and a cucumber? Do they know how to use a landline? <laughs> and do they know how to close the sliding door of a minivan that does not have automatic doors? Then I've also found myself wondering, do they know um, what to do in an uncomfortable position? Do they know, are they able to tell when they're getting scammed? Um, do they have the good sense to avoid a dangerous situation? It's next to impossible to equip them with every nugget of knowledge that they will need. But I've decided that there is one thing that solves all of my concerns. If they, if they can identify and follow the promptings of the Holy Ghost, then I won't need to worry about them anymore. Well, not as much. When my husband and I were packing for a cr the cruise, we, I didn't bring a hair dryer because the cabins had them. And the first time I went to dry my hair, I flipped the switch on and I was sorely disappointed with the lack of airflow. It, was, it just took forever to dry my hair and I found myself feeling frustrated that I didn't bring my own hair dryer. Well, when I went to hang the hair dryer back up on the wall, I noticed that the switch went two ways, up and down. And when I flipped it down, the full force of the hair dryer smacked me in the face and I realized my mistake. But the frustrating thing was I had the answer in my hands the whole time. And, uh, um, and if someone would have shown me how to use the full power of the hair dryer, then my job would have been a lot easier. And this is how the gift of the Holy Ghost works. As parents, we need to teach our children how to access the full power of the Holy Ghost so that their jobs on this life can be performed much easier. So why is it important for our children to learn the gospel? If we look at these three reasons we've just discussed, you'll notice something interesting. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Ghost. It's the Godhead. When, we, when our children learn about the gospel, they will learn about the unique and individual roles of each member of the Godhead. By doing so, they will have all they need to succeed in life. I don't know about you, but that's what I want for my children. Sister Joy D. Jones has said, our children will be strengthened at a time when they need it most, when they are being bombarded by the darts of the adversary. Teaching them the gospel will suit them in their protective armor every day. We need to have our children ready for battle. You might be sitting here thinking, well, this is all great, and I want to do this for my children, but I can't do it. You might be thinking it's too overwhelming. You might not know where to start. You might be unsure about what methods to use with your kids. Well, here are three things to help you answer the question, how can I do this? First, you are enough. 
Like Mary Poppins, you are practically perfect in every way, at least for your kids. I'm convinced that specific children were sent to specific parents for specific reasons. I also believe that there's no one else who can do the job that you were sent to do. You have all the tools you need in your very own carpet bag. Your gifts and talents are just waiting to be pulled out and utilized. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I went to my son's karate class and I had two younger kids with me, Claire who was about five and Xander who was about two. At one point during the class, I realized I couldn't see my two-year-old anymore. And I looked all around, couldn't see him, and I started, to get, I started to panic a little bit because the studio was on a really busy street and I was worried that he had somehow pushed the door open and gone outside onto the street. So I'm, I'm frantically looking around, becoming more and more distraught, and my little five-year-old um, starts tugging on my leg and says, Mom, Mom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't deal with this right now. <laughs> and I was like, kind of swatted her away like a gnat because I'm more focused on finding my two-year-old. And uh, she became more persistent, mom, mom. And finally I turn her, what, what? And she says, mom, you're holding him. <laughs> and sure enough, I looked down and in my arms, my two-year-old was there the whole time. <laughs> he wasn't lost, he was right there. Oh my goodness. Well, this is just like your abilities. You already have what you need. Um, for example, I was talking to a group of friends one day, and um, they were telling me some of the things that they'd done to teach the gospel. Uh, one sister who was very outdoorsy and loved nature, she took her kids to Utah Lake to teach them about Peter walking on the water. Another sister who was musically inclined told me about some religious music, music channels she'd found and how she plays them for her kids every Sunday throughout the day. Another sister who's very intuitive told me about her primary class and how she and her husband had been inspired to use the children as fish and a blanket as a net when they were teaching about being fishers of men. They all had specific strengths that they used to teach the gospel. They didn't need to scour Pinterest or purchase someone else's lessons. All they had to do was tap into their unique gifts and talents to find ideas. And you are the same way. You already have everything you need to teach your children the gospel. You just need to trust in yourself and your abilities. You can do this. You are enough. Second, your prayers will be answered, and the answer will be exactly what you need. Heavenly Father wants us to succeed, so he'll do everything he can to help us, but we just need to do our part, which includes asking him for help. As parents, we only have these children for a few, few precious years until they move out on their own, so we have to do everything in our power to teach them what they need um, in the short time they're under our care. Because the stakes are so high, of course the Spirit will help us. A few years ago, uh, the church was focused on encouraging its members to keep the Sabbath day holy. I spent a lot of time pondering and praying um, for revelation about what specifically our family could do. Um, I'd been praying, and finally the answers came to me during a regional conference. Um, one of the speakers was talking about the Sabbath day, and halfway through her talk, um, I had an idea of something our family could do, and it was accompanied by the Spirit so strongly that I knew it was direct inspiration for our family. After discussing it with my husband that evening, we implemented it the next Sunday. We called it Sunday Service, um, and each week we would gather together as a family to pray for someone, um, a name for a person that we could give service to. Um, and we would have uh, two people. We would have a receiver of inspiration, and we would have the prayer, or the person who says the prayer. Um, and we would rotate. So the following week, um, the person who received the inspiration would be the person who said the prayer. Um, and then we would draw a new name out of the bowl for the person to be the receiver. And that way, they all got to participate in um, the roles. Um, and then we instructed the kids on how to listen and said, okay, when you're done, when the prayer is done, just fold your arms and everyone's gonna be quiet. We're gonna keep our heads bowed, our prayers, or our arms folded, and you just think. And a name will probably come into your head. And that is most likely the name that Heavenly Father is telling us that should receive our service. Um, and then they got to select the type of service they, that we did and also whether it was anonymous or not. This exercise gave us a chance to teach our children how to pray for something specific, how to receive revelation, how the Spirit speaks to them individually, how to serve with intent, and how prayers are answered. Let me tell you about a few of the experiences we had. The first name drawn was Claire, and she was 11 at the time. Um, and after the prayer, she thought for a minute, and she said, oh, I had two names come to mind. Um, and the first one was your friend with the dark hair. And I said, Sandy? And she said, yeah, yeah. 
She said, but I don't, I think I should, we should do it for the second name, and that's Sister Jansen. And I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? And she's got a sweet tooth. I, I thought for sure she'd say make cookies, but she said, um, just let's write her thank you note and let's make it anonymous. And so we did. We wrote her a thank you note and dropped it on her doorstep and left it. And um, Sister Jansen had just been released from the primary president. And what Claire didn't know was that she was feeling somewhat dejected and pushed aside. And I think Heavenly Father knew that she needed a thank you card. The next week, Jane's name was drawn, and she was six. She was only six years old. And after the prayer, we all sat quietly. And I'm not sure if Jane thought she had to take a long time, or if she forgot what she was doing and started daydreaming, or if she couldn't decide, or maybe it just took a long time. She sat there forever. And my husband and I, we kind of looked at each other, and we're like, do we stop this? Do we keep it going? And finally, she lifted her head, and she said, Miss Nikki, who was her former preschool teacher. And uh, so we decided to take a bunch of suckers that we had and put them around the edge of a paper. And then in the middle, we wrote, we are licky to have you as a neighbor. <laughs> Love the Adams, I know. Um, and then we left it on our doorstep. And then she texted me the next day and thanked us for the nice card. Um, and we never found out the reason why um, she needed that note, but I'm sure Heavenly Father knows. The next week, Alice's name was drawn and she was 16 years old. She was fairly quick to say Sandy, and I was surprised, found myself wondering why her, why her name had come up twice now, especially because Sandy was a good friend and she was pretty stable. Um, so we, Alice decided that we should give her a heart attack where you write nice notes on hearts and, and put them on her door. Well, it was late at night and Sandy goes to bed pretty early, so, um, and we were leaving the next day on a trip, so we decided to do it when we got back. Well, two weeks later, we um, went to draw another name and realized we had never done Alice's service. And so we all wrote um, notes on, on the hearts, um, including, you are loved. And I also, she, she would recognize my handwriting, so I put some inside jokes on there. Um, and we drove over to her house, wondering if it was once again too late, but we saw lights on, so we decided to go ahead and do it. Um, we quickly taped the hearts to her door, and then my son knocked really loudly on the door, and then we all ran back to the car, and we were all giggling and thought it was so much fun. Well, the next day, Sandy came over and told me her side of the story. She said to me, this is more than a tender mercy, this is a miracle to me. The same, <clears throat> the same day as the heart attack, someone had come over to her house, and Sandy had been on the receiving end of some harsh judgments. She said, in spite of my best efforts to shield myself from the poison darts coming my way, some pierced me, and I felt defeated. Later that night, still in tears over the incident, she had gone into her bedroom to pray for peace. She was on her knees and had just finished the words, just let me know I'm loved, when she heard a loud knock at the door. That was my son's knock. She walked out, saw the hearts, especially the one that said, you are loved, and fell to her knees weeping. It was an immediate and direct answer to her prayer. She said, knowing that Heavenly Father loves me and will orchestrate and set into motion events long before they happen, just to shower love on his children, is so precious to me. One of the coolest things to me is that all of these neat experiences were the direct result of my children, my young children, receiving specific revelation from the Lord and acting on it. And all because I prayed, I prayed, and pondered about how to best teach my family. My prayer was answered in exactly the way our family needed, and as it turns out, how others needed it as well. You can have the same results. When you pray about how to teach your children the gospel, your prayers will be answered. The Spirit will help you know what to do, and most likely, it will be something that utilizes your unique gifts and talents. Third, focus on one thing at a time. Sometimes the big picture is a little much to take in all at once, so we zone out and get discouraged. But if we take one step at a time and keep moving forward, pretty soon the big picture is completed. Take Lego sets, for example. Um, to this day, I still love to assemble Lego sets. And my weakness, surprise, surprise, has been the Disney Princess series they've come out with. Um, for Christmas one year, I bought myself Cinderella's Castle, and it's a huge monstrosity. It's 4,000 pieces, over 4,000 pieces, and about three feet tall. And I looked at the picture and wondered how I could ever build it. Um, especially because the instruction book was about two inches thick. Well, when I finally decided to delve into it, I opened the instructions and found out that they were really quite simple. Uh, in the corner, it shows all the pieces you need, only a few at a time, and then the main picture shows you how those pieces go together. Once you've assembled those few pieces, the next page adds on, but still only a few pieces at a time. 
By working in this way, step by step, one page at a time, pretty soon I had the entire castle built. What a relief and source of pride. Teaching our children the gospel is a lot like this. When we think of the enormity of the task, it seems nearly impossible, but when we take it one step at a time, it becomes more manageable, especially when we have the spirit on our side, showing us the pieces to assemble first. Jeffrey R. Holland said, whatever changes the Lord directs in an organization or a schedule or a curriculum or a family, I might add, what he's really hoping to change is you and me. He wants to change our hearts and enhance our future. I experienced this a few months ago when our family was in a spiritual drought and famine, and we needed some serious disaster relief. We were about ready to start drinking figurative toilet water. That's how lacking it was. I felt overwhelmed and tiny compared to what needed to be done. I admit, I also felt a little lazy and didn't want to put forth any effort. I decided to change my heart and enhance our future. I prayed to Heavenly Father and asked him what the one thing was that I could start doing in order to get my family back on track. The answer was family council. We started the next Sunday and I typed up an agenda. The number one item was, how can our family become more spiritually in tune? I also included some practical concerns about household rules, some positive things going on. We talked about some fun activities we want to do during fall break and Jane's upcoming birthday. We ended with a quick review of calendar and scheduling items and it was a very successful meeting. After holding family council for a few weeks, I asked Heavenly Father for the next step. The answer was to use family council as a way to introduce family history. So I started adding family history moments to the agenda and told a story from our family history, which led to the next direction I got from Heavenly Father. I was prompted to get my mom's help with a project. We're putting together a children's book of stories taken from our family history, but written and illustrated in a way that is appealing to young children. We wanted my kids and her other grandkids to feel the power of our ancestors' spirits. The next step from my family was a three-week media fast based on a book I read called Reset Your Child's Brain by Victoria Dunkley. I won't go into details, but this was spirit-driven and produced results in my kids that still make me want to cry with joy. After the media fast, we were directed to reinstitute scripture study, which we decided to do right, after bed, or right before bedtime. It brought a peace into our home as well as a new bedtime routine. Over the course of a few months, I felt the effects of Satan lessening, and our family was happier and treated each other with more kindness. When I look back to where we started, I, can't, I can see how far we've come, and I wonder how we did it all. And then I remember that we didn't do it all at once. We did it step by step, one thing at a time, as directed by the Lord. We aren't finished by any means. In fact, we're starting to spiral, back, spiral backwards into the toilet bowl again. But I'm not worried. I know that I can just ask Heavenly Father what the next one thing is, and he'll direct us step by step. If you're still wondering how can I do this, just remember, you are enough, your prayers will be answered, and focus on one thing at a time. So we've talked about um, why to teach our children the gospel and how. Um, now let's talk a little bit about some specific ideas. Um, now don't get overwhelmed with these because um, I, I know ideas can be overwhelming, but just use these as a jump start to your own imagination. Um, these, here are seven of my favorite go-to activities for young children. Um, they're not the most creative things in the world, but I guarantee you that kids will love them. Um, and as a side benefit, most of them are easy to make or implement. First one is memory. I'm gonna go through these one by one, so don't worry about not getting all this down. Memory, this is one of my favorite activities. You can basically, you can turn anything into a memory game. You just make two copies of it. Um, but you can put pictures, scriptures, words, photos, even small objects onto cards, and then you have a memory game. Um, the middle picture shows a variation where you do a bingo type game with pictures and use coverings. This one has Easter eggs, and then when you find the matches, you take the coverings off. Um, that one's good for small kids because they actually memorize where, <laughs> where things are, and they find the matches really fast. Um, and then as a bonus, once you have the memory game made, you can play um, Go Fish and Old Maid with the same cards. So you have three for the price of one. Um, and it's a good thing to teach kids because they're memorizing as they play the game. Two, puzzles. Once again, you can turn pretty much anything into a puzzle. Um, you can cut it out in squiggly shapes like a traditional puzzle, or sometimes straight lines can be more challenging, like the middle pictures. Um, you can also do strip puzzles, like on the right, um, and you can mount them on large popsicle sticks to make them more durable. Um, or you could also print the puzzles on magnetic sheets um, and use them on refrigerators or cookie sheets or even metal lunch boxes that actually double as storage. Um, 
hide and find. This one's kind of self-explanatory. Someone hides it and the other person finds it. Um, but young kids love this game and they play it over and over again. Um, you can make it um, more complicated by adding clues into a treasure hunt. Um, you can play the classic hot and gold. You can pre-hide things before the activity or just have people close their eyes. Um, you can even put stuff in rice, flour, or beans and have them find it in there. Um, you can put a teaching emphasis on it by playing hide and hide and find and assemble with puzzle pieces, word strips, parts of a picture, objects, and you gather them, put them together, and then and you teach about that. Books. Kids love books. Um, they can be purchased or homemade. A lot of stores and online ret retailers sell religious um, books that you can buy. Um, or you can use cheap four by six photo albums and make your own. Um, or even binders and page protectors work. Um, you can have kids illustrate their own um, scripture stories and put, turn them into a family book. Um, you can print out coloring sheets, mazes, word puzzles from the friend online and make an activity book. You can turn Mormon ads or church artwork into a book um, to be used during sacrament meeting. Um, you can make a bedtime book uh, with family history stories for your kids. Um, possibilities are endless. Sorting and matching games. Now this might seem kind of boring to you, but kids love to classify and create order. Um, in fact, one time I was in Hobby Lobby and my four-year-old saw this table scatter picture on the left and fell in love with it. Um, and so I bought it and gave her three cups and she sorted those things over and over and over again. She still sorts them. And she, you know, by color, by shape and categories, I have no idea, but she knew. <laughs> um, muffin tins are also a great sorting container because you can just swap out the bottoms for different um, topics. Uh, like you can sort books of scripture into correct standard works, um, quotes or scriptures and who said them situations into choosing the right or choosing the wrong. Um, you can even take symbols of topics like coins for tithing or food for word of wisdom, um, hearts and smiley faces for love and kindness, uh, colored CTR, CTR shields and sort them by color, anything like that. Uh, file folders also make great matching games and you can either make them yourself, like this one has pass along cards, or you can print them out online. There's tons of them online and kids love them. Um, music. This one, uh, if any time you want a kid to learn something, you just sing it to them. <laughs> um, and you can use instruments, percussion. Um, in fact, one time I <laughs> taught, I was teaching primary kids and um, the scripture, uh, I think it's Mosiah 2.17, um, and I taught them like this and they snapped their fingers and said, when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God, cha-cha-cha. And I think Heavenly Father will have words with me for adding cha-cha-cha to his scriptures, but they all remember it to this day. Like years later, they all say cha-cha-cha at the end of that scripture, and they're going to be missionaries and say cha-cha-cha to the people. But they remember it just because we put it to a chant. Um, music is just magical like that. Um, karaoke night with microphones. Give a kid a microphone and they come alive. Um, and you can sing you know, church music and it's a last minute lesson. Um, children's songbook, you can play I Spy um, and find the picture. When you find the picture, you can sing the songs. Anyway, all kinds of stuff to do with music. Um, last one is stations, and I've used this with all age groups. Um, and there are two different rotations, um, round robin and amusement park. Uh, round robin is the traditional way where you put kids into small groups and then you start each group at a station. And then at, once the time is up, then everyone rotates to the next station. Um, amusement park is where you have all the stations set up and the kids decide where they want to go based on how long or short the lines are, kind of like an amusement park. Um, you go to the, the rides that have the shortest lines and then come back if the line's too long. Um, and kids are pretty good about budgeting their time with this. Um, then there's two types of activities, make and take or learn and leave. And make and take is where they do something in each station and then take it with them. And learn and leave is where they do something and then leave it for the next group to do. Um, uh, let's see. I, um, I have three pictures, uh, but I, because of time, I won't go into them, of some stations I've done, but you get the idea. Um, so, in closing, just remember what we've talked about today, um, teaching your children about the Godhead, and that's why. Um, how can you do it? You can do it. You are enough, and your prayers will be answered, and just do it one step at a time. Um, and we talked about some ideas. Um, <clears throat> if, you invest, um, if you invest the time, energy, and faith to make things happen, then you will see results, I guarantee you. Your children will be spiritually protected, you will have peace enter your family's home, and you will be a Mary Poppins to your children. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Hello. Um, 
My name's Becky Thomas, and I live in Florida at the time, at, at this time, and I'm originally from Ohio, uh, northeastern Ohio. I was down in Florida trying to get ready for this, and um, my sister had bone cancer, and she passed away this month. So it got to be a pretty difficult situation, what I was going to do, and I got in touch with Devin, and he said, don't worry about it, and you know, I said, I wanna, I'd like to come, I don't know, and then, um, while I'm trying to, you know, we're waiting for the funeral and things like that, and then it turned out um, my father got really sick, and the doctor said if, to my brother that lives in Ohio, if you want to say goodbye to your father, you need to get your siblings up here. So we all came up. I drove up, and uh, Dad recovered. He's 100 years old, uh, will be 101, and they said he recovered like a 50-year-old man. So anyway, I was up at Dad's, and I literally, when I got that message, I just started throwing things in the trunk of my car and car, and, and I drove here, too, from Ohio. So I've been in the car a lot. If I fall asleep during this, um, please let me sleep. No. Um, I'd like to start, I, I taught school mostly in Florida in the public schools for 28 years until I finally had to leave. And I left mainly, my health wasn't the best, but I left mainly because of what was happening in the schools. And what's been interesting here today with you is that I've talked with different people here and I've asked them, you know, what do you do? And if they teach in the schools here, I ask them, well, how is it? Oh, it's great, I love it. Go to Florida, I won't say which county I was in, but go to Florida and ask teachers that same question and you won't get those same answers. You'll get answers like, I've gotta get out, I can't take it, I don't, this isn't what I wanted to do. I used to have new teachers come in, close my door and just cry and say, I hate this job. And I said, it's because you're not teaching. Because where I was and where a lot of schools are, we don't teach that much anymore. We do testing and we do statistics. And the last meeting I went to where my principal, um, it was the first day of school and we had a, a teacher's meeting. And our principal said to us, and there is no time for fun and I am talking about first grade on, no, kindergarten on up. And I knew then I had to leave. I thought I can't do this anymore. If I can't enjoy what I'm doing and the kids can't enjoy learning, I don't wanna be a part of this. And it, so I decided I was gonna leave, uh, that I was gonna leave at the end of the year and that I would go on my own and do in-school field trips and all this kind of thing. And um, I'm just about out of food money. So <laughs> in other words, you know, starving artist thing. Um, and when Devin read that, the bio or whatever, and I just thought, I better clear a couple things up. Where it said I was the most influential teacher in Orange County, I really did win an award for that, but honestly, I think they asked one child I had out of the whole county, and she said me. And so I've got this great title, but most of the kids in Orange County don't even know who I am, so, and some of them know who I am and don't like me. So um, anyway. I want to start real quickly, and I know it's getting to the end, and I've got to keep my time right, but um, all of us are creative. I think creativity in the classroom is extremely important, and it doesn't matter if you're teaching young adults or if you're teaching little kids or um, just regular adults. You know, People have asked me to teach my math program to them because um, they didn't understand math when they were in school, and these are adults, and they said, I think we could, I could have fun doing it your way, which... I brought, my, I brought my 100 square foot math mat and it's still back in the container back there because I thought we had another speaker and I could get it, get it all put together, but it's all right. Um, I believe that I know we're all creators because God is our father and he is the greatest creator there is. And we come from him and we have his traits and creativity is one of those traits. We must believe that because creativity um, is how we're going, I mean, we're going to have to someday learn how to do the things our Father in Heaven does, and it's creation. So in the classroom, for myself, I worked with a lot of children that were, um, had difficulties. I, I, I worked in regular classrooms, but anyone in here who's in the public schools knows that you have a lot of different types of learners. It's no longer, when I was in school, they had the regular classes, and then they had a, one class, for kids, usually it, were, it was kids who had anger problems, but their anger problems probably came from learning disabilities, where they were so frustrated, and at that time, nothing was ever diagnosed. And as far as dyslexia or um, autism or all these different things that we now have in the classroom. So 
the, one of the schools where I was teaching, I taught in a lot of Title I schools where they're government subsidized. Um, the kids couldn't remember certain things in math, no matter how many times we did it. And I like to write songs, so I thought I'm just going to write some songs. So I started writing songs. For Christmas, I gave them, I'm surprised those kids ever came back, I gave them a CD I made on, for math. <laughs> Here you go, Merry Christmas. And, and I can remember they were all, I must have given them something else because they wouldn't have been that happy about that. So anyway, so I said, take this home, and if you get a chance over um, you know, break, Go ahead and listen to it. Well, they came back, and this was in a tough area of Orlando. And, um, and the reason I say that is the tough areas, when I say tough, I'm talking about murders and things like this that went on. And so a lot of people's mind, it, um, their minds aren't on education. They're on survival. So they came back, and we started doing a review on the board. They were getting every answer right. And I, I was thinking, you know, I, was, I wasn't facing them, I was writing on the blackboard, it was still a blackboard. And um, I thought, what's going on? You know, they can't be cheating, I'm just making this stuff up. And uh, finally I turned around and I said, boys and girls, I said, did you take genius pills over the holiday? And they said, no, we listened to the CD. Well, I couldn't, first of all, I couldn't believe they would listen to that CD over break, but, you know, Christmas, but they did. And the other thing was, I didn't want to get my hopes up that that could really help that much but it did, and it turned out that um, their scores, they weren't, they didn't turn in like straight A students, but they started understanding standing concepts, and they could remember formulas, and all because it was to music, and we all know, uh, Melissa, who was just here, talked about that, that we know that music helps people learn, you can learn through music. Um, so I went ahead and did that, well I ended up at being asked to teach it to the whole school, so I did this program with the whole school, Anyway, um, some things came out of that, and what I, what I want, the reason I'm telling you this is because I know every one of you in here at some time has an idea. You have an idea, and maybe you don't act on it because time, time is it's hard. Money, some of our ideas take money, um, and maybe fear, what if it doesn't work? Well, trust me, a lot of my ideas didn't work. I almost burned the whole school down in one school. Literally, it was awful. We left the rock candy on the Bunsen burner thing, that, and we went to an assembly, and we all forgot. All the kids, I forgot it was on. They forgot. And we were walking back, and it was Thanksgiving, and the, the day before Thanksgiving, and I was in this great mood because they had just done this wonderful performance for Thanksgiving. And I was going by all the teachers, oh, happy Thanksgiving, happy. And all of a sudden, one of my kids who was, had anger problems starts screaming. And I thought, what is wrong? And I look, and there's smoke billowing out of the room. And I thought, oh my goodness, the rock candy didn't work again. No. And I thought, oh my goodness, the rock candy. So when I did that, the kid that had anger problems screamed across the whole campus, fire, fire. And I'm telling him to be quiet. Oh, there's no fire. And I, I went in there, and honestly, it was just seconds from bursting into to flame. The really good thing about this was I had a principal at that time. She was the best principal I ever had. And one thing I loved about her, she had a great sense of humor. Well, when she saw the pan, it had like a volcano coming up out of it. She just laughed her head off, and she put it on the announcements and said, I want you to all take a look at Miss Thomas's experiment. Miss Thomas's class experiment. One thing about Miss Thomas is she tries, and I thought, I'm going to kill her. No. <laughs> but anyway, so um, that one was a big failure. And, um, but my principal knew how to turn it around and make it into something good. And she gave the whole school a laugh. I mean, I, this secretary we had there never smiled. She was always kind of grouchy. I've never seen anyone laugh so hard in my life. She thought that was just the funniest thing. I thought, you know, it was worth almost bringing the school down just to watch her smile. So I, I just want to say that if you have creative ideas, if you have ideas and you think, well, you know, probably wouldn't work, whatever, go ahead and try them. You never know who you're going to influence or help through your ideas. Um, and they say that if you get a good idea to act on it immediately because there are X amount, I don't know how many people around the world that get that same idea at the same time, basically. So someone needs to act on it, and it should be you. Um, your kids will love it if you do the creative things and make school or if you're teaching the, uh, in the church education system, um, doing something a little different is good to... Um, wake the kids up and have them also have a different perspective on it. I just want to tell you real quickly, when I, after doing the songs, I um, went to another, well actually, 
Yeah, I did. I went to another school. And I was lying. I had back surgery. And I was lying in bed. And I was thinking about what else? School. I know every elementary teacher I know, when they're not at school teaching, they're thinking about school and teaching. And um, I thought, if I could get the kids to walk something on a coordinate, a coordinate grid, I think it could become part of them more even than just the song. So I came up with this math mat, and it was, I made it out of masking tape. And anybody in here could do it. Um, if you want to see my math mat afterwards, I'll show it to you. But um, it's big. I won't take it all out, but I can show you the concept. And it was just an easy concept. It was just a coordinate grid with numbers going down on the axes, you know. And, and um, so when I got back to school, I took the, ma the uh, masking tape, made the mat out of masking tape. The kids walked in my first class. By that time, I was teaching the whole school. The kids walked in. They were so excited. And I thought, I can't believe it. They're excited about masking tape on the floor. And they really were excited. And so I told them what it was for. We started using it. Well, I started. I found out I could use it for all kinds of things. I thought it was just for coordinates. Well, anyway, one day I was teaching. I had gone to another school. That's when I went to the next school. Took it with me. I was teaching my first graders. And um, I had, we were doing simple subtraction. So I said, OK, who would like to go on the mat and show us how to subtract five, take away three? Well, this little boy said, I'll do it. You know, so he got on there. And I said, OK, go ahead. Well, he did three, take away five instead. And when he got to the, to the um, going to the five, he went off the mat. And, and right away, what would some of you want to do when he first stepped on that three? What would you want to do? Exactly, correct him. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I thought, ooh, I got, and something in me said, no, let him go ahead and let's see if you can introduce negative numbers to these six year olds. So he did. He went off the, off the mat. And I said, so um, what's the answer? And he said, zero. And I said, are you on the zero? And he said, no. And I said, well, where are you? He goes, I'm off the mat. I don't know what the number is. And I said, OK, we're entering the negative zone. And the kids all said, negative zone? What's that? So anyway, I explained about money and owing people and buying a house. And, and um, I did talk to him about that. <laughs> I, I got kind of carried away sometimes with you know, them being six. But anyway, um, and then and also temperature. Well, then um, he went back on, and he figured it out. And, he, and I taught him negative, and he said, negative two. I was like, oh, this is so exciting. Well, that week, I said, OK, it was the end of the week. And I said, I'm going to give you a little um, quiz. I said, I'm going to give you a piece of paper. I want you all to write your own math problem, subtraction problem, and solve it. So they were all writing away. And it was time for lunch or whatever, music. And um, I took them down to music, collected their papers, took them down to music, got back and graded them. Well, as I was grading them, there were five boys and none of these boys sat by each other, but there were five boys, and every single one of them wrote a subtraction problem with a negative answer and got it right. And I just thought, I'm going to be really rich because this works now. <laughs> Guess what? I have one math mat, and I have no money. But anyway, so um, it was really, really exciting. And it was a simple concept. So you never know. And I'm sure I wish we had a lot more time where I could pe have people share stories, because I know. Others of you out here have stories about things that have happened, and you were so happy that they worked the way they did. Um, I'm going to have to go really fast. Humor in the classroom. How many of you have used humor in the classroom? Raise your hand. That's good. That's good. That's, humor in the classroom. Has it worked for you? Does it work when you use humor in the classroom? In what way? How would you say it worked? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Can you? Did you all hear him? He taught fifth grade, and he said sarcasm's the language they speak. So he, you know, got sarcastic with them. And <laughs> where are they now? What jail? No, I'm, <laughs> so I'm teasing because I got sarcastic with my fifth graders too. I taught sixth through kindergarten, so I and I taught in all kinds of schools. Yes. It, it exactly. Exactly. I had made some, some papers that I wanted to pass out to you. Well, I have them on the back table for you. And um, I don't think there, I think I did 30. I don't know how many people are in here. But anyway, I put that in there, actually, that it builds, that it actually, for me, a teacher that was like that, you know, you've got to keep your boundaries. You can't let the kids come in and think they're at your level. But you, it gives them a feeling, I think, of safety and a feeling of 
I can be real around my teacher, I can be myself, and because that's a way of them getting to know you. I'd like to share just a couple humorous things from my classroom. Um, one of them was um, a girl asked me, this, this was about 20, probably about 25 years ago. I can imagine what, she'll th what she would say if she saw me now this much older. Um, but anyway, she asked if she could stay after school for a minute. She was a really sweet girl. And I said, sure, Lizzie, you know, and I was thinking, I'm such a good teacher. I'm letting her stay after. I'm going to counsel her. And, you know, they'll talk about me someday. And she sat down. I said, what, do you, what would you like to talk about? And she said, well, when, when you were in high school, did you have a lot of boyfriends? I said, well, I always had a boyfriend. She said, I thought so. You look like you used to be pretty. <laughs> and I said, Lissy, you really need to go now. I've got work to do. I was so upset. I'm like, well, you used to be pretty. Yeah, that was tw about 25 years ago. I can imagine what she'd say now. But anyway, are you Miss Thomas? I'm not sure. Um, anyway. Um, another thing, another time, one of the boys in my class, they were, it was indoor recess, and they were sitting in a little circle, and I was at the desk grading papers, and the kids were doing indoor games, and I hope this one's all right to tell. It's not really bad. It's funny to me, but I don't ever swear, and this isn't exactly swearing. Is it okay? <laughs> well, anybody, is there anybody here that would offend? <laughs> no, anyway, one of the boys, they were six-year-olds, one of the boys came up to me and said, Miss Thomas, Albert just swore. And I said, really? And I looked over and Albert's sitting there in this circle with this boy and he looks up at me and, like, and, I, and I looked at him and the kid said, do you wanna know what he said? I said, no, not really. And he said, he said, I, I wrote this down so I remember, he said the WTH word. And I said, the WTH word? He goes, what the L? <laughs> WT. Oh, I wrote it wrong. No wonder. I just messed up my joke. Pretend you didn't hear that. I'm going to, WTL. He goes, he said the WTL word. And I said, uh, what? What the L? <laughs> anyway, all right. Wasn't that funny? And we're all good Mormons, so, you know, we wouldn't laugh at stuff like that. But anyway, it was, my, my thing when it happened, I thought, don't laugh. Because I wanted to laugh really hard. Because this kid, I mean, he was so scared. And this kid's thinking he's grown up. And I just looked at the kid like, like that, and inside I thought, first graders are so funny. Um, they do tell the jokes better than I do. Um, and then one last little situation that happened. Um, we had made lemonade one, I, have a, I had a lemon tree at my house, and great lemons that were on it, and I brought, it, brought a lemon in for everybody. We ho had a whole lemon day, and after the lemon day, we made lemonade at the end of the day, and we had sugar, and we were sticky all over. Well, anyway, I had this little, Pink, pink, little white plastic fork I brought with me to cut the lemons because one time we went to the jail and I had forgotten we had done Valentine cupcakes the day before and I put the butter knife in my um, purse, totally forgot to take it out. We went to the, the jail the next day and as all my kids left and were looking back, Miss Thomas, I was with the police in a room. They were investigating my whole purse and I thought, are you kidding me? This is a butter knife, but anyway. So I had this little white serrated knife that I used to cut the lemons. So I washed it off and stuck it in my purse. And for some reason, I took my purse with me to walk the kids to the bus. I'm not sure why, but I had my purse with me. And as I was walking along, the kids said, two of the kids at the end of the line, the, the um, first grader said, Miss Thomas, there's a knife in the grass over here. And I immediately thought of my serrated plastic knife. And I thought, oh, okay. I said, well, why don't you just pick it up and, um, and bring it over to me? And they said, all right. And I thought, why did they say it like that? And I looked around, and they had a machete in their hand. What had happened is there had been some workers, and they were from Mexico, and they used machetes there. And they, one of the workers had left his machete by one of the portables where the kids came out. And I'm dying. And I said, don't. And, and of course, all the kids turn around. They're like, whoa. And they all start running. I said, oh, I was so, so scared. And I said, don't move. I said, just stand there. So I go over, and I took the machete. And all of a sudden, every single child in my class went, ah. And they all ran down the sidewalk to the buses. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in so much trouble, because you're never allowed to let those kids by themselves at the buses. And I'm yelling at them, and I'm yelling, stop, stop. And I took the machete, I said, stop. And, and they turned around, and I, it, it was, I wish I'd had a camera. All of them turned around at the same time, like they just swiveled their feet and looked like this and went, ah! 
and they, they took off. And I didn't see him the rest of the day, and I thought, I don't even care if I get in trouble. So I'm walking across the playground with this machete, and I thought, what are the chances of having a machete as you're walking your kids to the bus? I, it was just the craziest. I told my principal, and she just rolled her eyes and walked away, literally, and I thought, here I did something to save the day, and she didn't appreciate it at all. She just walked away like I was a troublemaker, and I thought, I found the guy I belonged to, and he wasn't grateful either, and I thought, <laughs> anyway. So those are just, and I'm, again, I'm sure you have lots of stories you could tell if, um, if you were up here. The last thing I'd like to share is, and, and humor is very important when you're teaching, I think, in the right time, in the right place, but I think it's very important. The last thing I'd like to share is inspiration in teaching. Um, I'm sure all of us in here at some time have gotten on our knees about our careers and our teaching and just needing the Lord's help. I know that the classes I taught, some of them were so difficult that I was afraid sometimes because at one time this kid wanted the class to end, and I said, sorry, I, it, was an, it was a lockdown class. They weren't allowed out of that class unless the whole class and all the adults went. The police were there almost every day, and I had to go in and teach this class in my program. And um, the, uh, one of the kids in it, when I was teaching it to some of the kids, I had to go in there and teach. And he said, okay, you can go now. I said, no, I really can't. I said, I still have 50, uh, 10 minutes. And he said, no, you can go now. And I said, sorry but I can't, and all of a sudden, these, little, these pointed scissors went right by my eye, and he was throwing them at my eye, but he missed, and um, so the, when I left that class, I was shaking, and I thought, I just don't know how much longer I can do this, because it was getting really rough. Um, we had quite a few lockdowns at the schools I taught at, because there were a lot of bad behavior, a lot of bad behavior going on with guns and other things, um, but I taught this one class, and they were really rough, really, really rough. And four te three teachers had walked out on them before I came. And um, I didn't know why they were such, they were mean and they were disrespectful. I would try to teach and they would walk around and talk to each other. I, and I'd never had trouble with classroom management and I, I tried everything. Well, I went home the first night and I prayed. I, and I prayed hard and said, whoops, that was an activity we're not gonna do. But anyway, so, sorry. Um, but I, I got on my knees and I asked the Lord to please, please find me another job. I said, I can't do this. These kids are too hard for me. And I got no answer. Went to school the next day, same thing. Went home, prayed, no answer. Went to school the next day. So three nights. Well, the, next, the last night I prayed about it. The Lord answered me. And he answered in two words. Does anyone have any idea what the Lord might have said to me about this class and me? I wanted out really, really badly. He said, love them. And I thought, oh, my God, I love them. They are so awful. <laughs> so, but I knew, you know, you know when you get an answer from the Lord. You know when he's talking to you. And you know when he talks to you, that means he knows you can do what he's telling you to do. And I didn't know I was going to do it, but I thought, he knows that I can do it. So I went back. And that day, they were just as rowdy and everything as, as normal. That day, when the kids were getting ready for lunch, lining up, they went past me to get in line. And um, one of the girls went by, and she had this beautiful bow in her hair. And just automatically, I said, I love your bow. That is beautiful. And for one second, she smiled. The kids would never smile for me, ever. And she smiled, and then she got stern again. And I knew then, it was like her heart opened just a little bit, and my heart opened. And for one second, I felt like I loved her. And, um, and I knew then what I was going to do. I thought, every day I'm going to look for two kids to compliment. And it has to be sincere. It has to be from my heart, because we know when a person is not being sincere. I mean, most of the time, we can tell. And so that's what I started doing. And the kids started opening up to me. They started trusting, because they knew when I was telling the truth to them. And they started opening. And I started finding out their lives. And one of them had been kidnapped when he was about five years old with his little brother and had bags on their head. The father kidnapped him and took him to Chicago with bags on their head. And so he had no trust at all. One of the girls, this redhead, who was fiery, she, her father was a heroin addict. And uh, he came in, broke into the house, took everything of value, came into her bedroom. She was hiding under the bed. And he smashed her piggy bank and took all her money. So I started understanding why these kids were the way they were. But as time went on, I really grew to love them. And they grew to love me. 
And at the end of the year, we had field day, and they got the Good Sportsmanship Award. And it was just a miracle in my mind. And after that, after they got the award, it was time to go home. So they all went out. It was pouring rain. And, and Florida, it really rain rains, you know. And we're running through the rain. Well, anyway, I get back to my desk. And one of the, my fire, my um, redheaded girl comes back in, barefoot, soaking wet. She throws this card on my desk and runs out. And I just laughed. I thought, mm hmm, that's Kelly. And um, I opened the card, and it said, Dear Ms. Thomas, we couldn't have won without you. Thank you. I love you. And I went home, and I was standing at the window doing dishes and thinking about the day and just the miracle. And I made a really short version. It took a long time before the class finally sat and finally learned. And it truly, in my mind, was a miracle. But the kids, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was standing by the window, and I was thinking about the difference between when I came and when I left, and how the when I was at the beginning, how um, hard it was. I wanted to love them. I did love them to begin with, and then I didn't because I got to, you know, they were so awful. And then I loved them. And then it hit me, the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah, the Old Testament is really rough. I mean, it's, for me, it's a very hard book to read because it's harsh, it's brutal. And, you know, these people are told to kill other people. And then you come to the New Testament, and here's the Savior in flesh. And it's all about love. And I, it just hit me. I thought, the reason the Lord couldn't be, he was all about love in the Old Testament. The problem was the children of Israel weren't ready for him to be all about love. They were so mixed in with so many cultures and were you know, sacrificing their children. They were doing terrible things. So the Lord could not treat them the same way as he can treat us when we're, when we're giving out love and when we're doing the right things. It's not that he doesn't love everyone. He can't bless us all the same because... If we obey the commandments, they're automatic blessings. It doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or not. You, you're blessed for obeying commandments. Um, and I realized it's because the people weren't ready. The, the Savior wanted to give them a higher level of love, but he couldn't do it. That's why Moses broke the Ten Commandments and went back up, and they got the law of Moses. Wow, that was, I'm glad we didn't have to live the law of Moses. Um, real quick, I know we're at the end. I just want to say that there was one other situation and I just thought this would be of interest to you. I was teaching in an all African American school downtown Orlando. It was very, very. It was a very difficult um, job I was doing. And um, again, this one class, fifth grade class would not listen. They fought all day. They fought all day long. And uh, I, all I did was break up fights. And I asked my principal to come in, and she wouldn't come in my room. Nobody would come in my room. So. Um, I was praying, again, a lot of the kids there were from Haiti, and I was praying on the way into school, and I just said, Heavenly Father, please help me. I don't know what to do to help these children. They're going to they're gonna fail the state test, and most of them did. And what the Lord said, which I think is, to me, it's kind of a lesson for all of us. Some of you already probably know this lesson. With the Lord, it wasn't about their academics and that they were going to fail the test. He knew that already. <laughs> he said... You must help rid them of superstition. And it was, that was a pretty shocking answer. But that day, all day, the kids were making superstitious comments. And I thought, oh my goodness. And then I had a little singing group after school. And this one girl in it was from Haiti. And she was very mean to the other girls. And finally, I pulled her over. And I took her in a, a, a what's it called? You know, the thing, portable. And... Um, I said, what's going on? I don't know what you mean. I said, you know what I mean. What is going on? You're so mean to those girls. I wish I had, I have a book that I have it all written out in. But anyway, it's better in the book than what I'm going to say. But she said, it was like the Lord unlocked her tongue and she said, it's superstition, it's voodoo, it's black magic. It brings you down, makes you depressed, makes you want to be mean. And I just stood there and thought, oh my gosh, the Lord just told me that I had to help rid them of superstition, and, she, and it was like she was unlocked and let me know what was going on. I just want you to know that teaching, I'm so thankful I was a teacher, and I still am. I still teach, but it's more of in a private way. I'm so thankful that I got to be a teacher. Those kids saved me many times because of their love. Um, in whatever capacity you teach in, you are loved too, I know that. Um, 
I just pray that as teachers, we'll be able to prepare our students for the building up of the kingdom for the second coming, which is, is going to be coming sometime soon, we don't know when, but to be a part of this and to be actually training the people who are going to be here to welcome in the Savior, what an honor it is and what a blessing you are to them. Thank you so much for letting me talk with you. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.